Tabletops will start after the following messages. What if music was magic? Against the Gloom is a fantasy TTRPG about punk pirate troubadours fighting back against a bleak world, one gig at a time. From Scripted Games, the studio that brought you Psychic Trash Detectives, comes a new game by Dustin Patrick Winter. Against the Gloom is about harnessing the power of music, finding chosen family, and building community in the face of the void. Find it now on Kickstarter. Rock on. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Tabletop. I am your host, Nick, and today we have our returning friend of the pod, Matt Capelli from Roleplay Chat. Matt, how are you doing? I'm good. It feels good to be back. <laughs> How's everybody doing? The the tabletoppers? Is that what you call your... <laughs> well, it's it, the jury is still out. <laughs> the jury's still out. Yeah, there was a, a whole Discord thread for a little while where, where we were discussing it and people uh, had a pretty visceral, <laughs> visceral oh, reaction whoa. to tabletoppers. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Well, um, then maybe I'll. I I didn't say that. I didn't say it. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that that uh, everyone can kind of self uh, self identify as their friend of the pod status. I I am I'm not putting a, t- a title out there to be shot down. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been great to see you. Uh, season four of Roleplay Chat just kind of wrapped up before the holiday. Uh, season five is starting up in, in March. So it felt like a good time to have you back on, get get you back into the interview mode. <laughs> and Yeah, I um, appreciate it. When we were talking offline, we were like, well, what do we want to talk about? And you were like, what about cliffhangers? I've been thinking a lot about those. And uh, I love, like last time we talked, we talked about the structure of sort of episodic games. And Mm -hmm. I feel like both of these topics kind of go hand in hand because the best way to set somebody up for the next episode of a game is with a cliffhanger. (laughs) Yes, very true. And it seems to be like that is a very TV kind of way to, you know, structure the pacing of a game. Yeah. When you look at a TV show, especially episodic ones, there's going to be a cliffhanger at the end of almost every episode i feel like that's like this the 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 cycle of how (laughs) a lot of these shows will will be kind of planned out totally Um, i mean even within an episode you have like going to commercial break back when commercials were a thing mm, and then you like have that cliffhanger to get people to come back after the ads to to watch the rest of the episode so i want to jump and dive in on this what uh specifically like so you and i talked last time and you say you do run primarily episodic games and so i wanted to kind of get a sense of like what how how do you you use cliffhangers do you use them at all do you like how do you kind of write them into a session you know what i mean yeah yeah well so let me let me give uh, a little more i guess things might have changed since the last time we spoke yeah um my games my current challenge for myself these days is to try to run games with as le- little prep as I can. Yeah. I'm really trying to trying to get that improv muscle as strong as it can be. Mm-hmm. Part because of circumstance, yeah, because time is is precious, and and also just, just for fun, yeah. you know, to to try something <laughs> new, try something different, and so while before I was running a lot of episodic games out of like intention yeah. and it, you know structure yeah now there's still like vignette style adventures mm-hmm. but uh i think because i don't have the opportunity to prepare my pacing quite as well uh sometimes an episode will be like two or three or four sessions yeah. long um now to, to get back to your question about the th- these these cliffhangers what I've been trying to do, and I know people listening might cringe. I know I know X and Threads got mad at me a couple <laughs> of times already. I I try my best to end every game on some kind of a cliffhanger. Mm. Now it's it's not gonna be um 
it's not going to be these like enormous moments of like character betrayal that, you know, these extremely cinematic quote unquote cliffhangers. But I do like leaving every game dangling something in front of my players to, to, to make them want to come back. Yeah. So that's kind of why I wanted to talk about cliffhangers with you today, Nick, because I think when we hear the word cliffhanger, the gut reaction is to think of this like huge background like moment where the bad guy reveals that really they were an angel all along Mm and you know like this whole crazy moment and that is a cliffhanger don't get me wrong but i think there's other nuance to be had for sure yeah i'm just hearing you talk i I sort of I think that also to clarify terms a little bit, cliffhangers are interesting because people usually think of cliffhangers happening at the end of a a moment, like an end, like they mm-hmm. they happen before the end of a story that is be like at the chunk of a story. Inherently, they kind of bring up the idea of like a unsatisfying sort of like a anticipatory hook for the next for the next thing that everyone uh, is going to sit down and play. Um, but what I kind of like for cliffhangers and like the way that I sort of tend to use them to your point of using them at, at every session kind of thing is that I, when I use them, I use them as sort of a, a, a almost like a teaser for what is to come rather than like you said, Oh my God, like the, the ground cracks open and you see this like monster coming out of it and we'll see you next time. <laughs> like, we, like we don't do yeah. that, but uh, not always anyway. <laughs> um, the, the main thing I like to do is sort of like um, some, sometimes I take it even away from the characters and I just give them a glimpse into something that is happening uh, like elsewhere in the world mm. so that cool. they yeah, as yeah. players can kind of get excited for the next thing that, and they can start kind of thinking about like, oh, what does that mean? What does that like mean for me as a character? Like, is there's going to be something happening regarding this or whatever? Um, so I'm not sure if that is quite the same as a cliffhanger that you were mentioning, but like I use those all the time as a sort of anticipatory, like excitement builder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, th- you know, while you were talking, I went and looked it up. So according to the Collins dictionary and God, this sounds terrible me saying that, but it's a situation <laughs> or part of play or movie or whatever, a game that le that because you are left for a long time not knowing what will happen next creates excitement or fright. Mm. Now we can we can you know extrapolate a better definition, I'm sure, but I don't think that's super interesting for us to sit all day defining what it means. Yeah. But it's it's this moment where people don't know what's going on, and they have to wait to find out. I think is the at least is how I use them, um, if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah, no, totally. I I, I think that. Um, going back to everyone getting mad at you, <laughs> I think that probably what they're doing then is kind of assuming the fright part of like this, this big thing is happening and like, oh my God, that like, how am I going to react to that? And then the session is over and that's just not feasible to do every time. Yeah, um, exactly. It's like almost impossible, in fact. <laughs> um, but well, definitely. Yeah. But I think that like, yeah, like, like you were saying when you were reading that out, that there's like different types that you can do to, to start building in anticipation and i think that it 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 doesn't always even have to be character based like you don't have to make the cliffhanger based on any of one of your players like they don't have to say like oh my god like my my character's father is going to be in the next episode like that doesn't have to happen every time either because going back to the sustainability thing it's just not great but it is good storytelling to get Mm -hmm. people excited for the next thing like uh one thing that i is sort of not a pet peeve but it's something that I try desperately to avoid. And this is hard when you do more improv stuff because you never know when a session's going to end. <laughs> but I really try to avoid like, okay, you guys go back to the, the inn and you like settle down. It's the end of the night and uh, we'll pick up there next time. Like that to me is, is there's nothing wrong with that, but it just feels like it's like missing something. Like you just missed an opportunity to do something interesting with it like it could just like the same example is like you go to the inn um and you all settle down elsewhere in the town uh a wolf howls and a gathering group of shadows like enter through the group enter through the gates or something like that is interesting and they're like what the fuck does that mean <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think the the recipe for a good cliffhanger in the context of a role playing game is to dole something out to your players that they want to engage with, but you stop them from doing that. So um, I remember I, I'm my my notes that I took that I have since lost are slowly coming back to me, Nick. And <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, I think there was like four or five different ways that we can do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully they'll come back to me as we're as we're chatting. From but from what I recall, one of them is using descriptors like that. Yeah. So describing out a scenario that you would probably use like before some kind of encounter, mm -hmm. you know, prepare some kind of scenario or invent some kind of scenario. This is kind of the beauty of it. You can invent some kind of scenario where, yeah, they return to the inn, but then when they get there, they hear howling from the cemetery and they look out the window and they see these wolf-like creatures, you know, climbing up over the hill. Yeah. Boom, done. We're, we're ending the game right here. Yeah. You kind of see what's going on. You, the players can kind of anticipate what's happening, but we're, we're not allowing them to engage just yet. We're letting them kind of get excited about it. So yeah, using these kinds of descriptions without even putting anybody in danger. Like you're not putting characters in danger. You're not putting players in danger. You're, like it's just, <laughs> it's just a description of a cool thing and then you and then you like close the curtain and say see you next time yeah um and and yeah. to your point I, and oh to, no to it. your point there like i think that it's interesting that you say like no one is being put into danger and i think that because that is if i was to try to guess the five it would be like you said um sort of a descriptor that happens right before the end that tries to build excitement or anticipation or fear or whatever i think the other one would be like a hanging action like um, yeah, you are going across like a, a you know a wire bridge, and one of the party members falls and snags onto a rope. And as like one of the characters looks back uh, and says, "Like, are you okay?" The GM says, "You know what you see. Like the first thing you see is the fear on their eye in their eyes. The second thing you see is that the rope is starting to break." And that's where the session ends. <laughs> like, you know, like yeah, that sort of thing. Exactly. Like you can do that. And then you can also, I think, like to to build fear or anticipation anticipation that way by putting somebody in harm, harm's way. The third one I Absolutely. think is like mechanically, you can kind of get somebody where you could end on something within your system's mechanics. Like if you're doing five E, you end on an initiative role. You end on a, you know, skill check. You end on a NPC's response to a social encounter. You know, something like that that is trying to pull in the mechanics of the game into the structure of the story. Like that, those are the three that I think that I would use the most. But then if I was going to say is like hinting at a big character moment. So that would be like yeah, the I, personal I, I, one. If I'm not mistaken, those those fit into the category. Like yeah. danger was <laughs> yes, one of them. I did it. I'm the best. <laughs> uh, the mechanics. The mechanics is interesting. I don't think. I don't think I thought of that one. Um, but I, I do like it. And then there was one of them was um, moral dilemma. Like pose or put your players in a situation that is very morally gray, mm. and before they make a decision you cut you you end the game and i love this that yeah <laughs> is really cool yeah it's really cool because it gives them the chance to mull it over yeah you know like in the moment a player might not actually have an answer for you they might give you some non-committal response that doesn't really create anything interesting mm -hmm. but if you give them the situation where like you know uh i'm trying to think of one that i've done recently where they were asked to participate in this um, almost like a, a trial. Mm. The, the party was asked to participate in a trial and they had to decide on who is going to be put at like there were, there were two trials happening and there were two con like uh, criminals or, or, or people who were needed to be tried. Yeah. And they were effectively the, People who were going to decide, like person A is going to see this judge with this courtroom, mm -hmm. and person B is going to go see a, a different courtroom with a different judge, mm -hmm. and like, but they had a lot of information about 
one of these one of these judges is crooked yeah and he has a, a hidden agenda and he's going to convict this person innocent or not like this person is going to be found guilty and they're going to be hung yeah. like that like that's going to happen so they need to make this decision of sending somebody that they've made a connection with there was an npc who they've grown fond of but who's done some shady stuff so do you send him to be tried and hang and hung yeah or do you keep this connection with you knowing that he's probably guilty of some stuff and anyway so so that was i set up this situation there was a lot of role play and mm-hmm. it was a lot of fun and then i said okay before you make your decision we're done yeah we'll find out what you do next time uh, they ended up keeping him <laughs> they ended up keeping him alive um which of course they of course they did but anyway it was it was fun to see them kind of think it through and one of my players even texted me you know out of game being like oh i really hope we can keep him he's super cool and i like the character and etc cetera, etc cetera. so i i really like that i think it i want to kind of pick into it a little bit too where one of the things that i find with uh these moments and the thing that i really like about doing this sort of action is that we ourselves are not perfect people. And when we play these games, we try to play like paragons of the the type that we're trying to emulate. So if, you know, Shade always likes to say like the big damn heroes and that kind of stuff, like, <laughs> you know, these people who know what to do, they are driven by personal convictions. Um, most people are not as extreme or are as self-assured as most heroes that we play in our games. And so letting them out of game, be able to talk it over, mull it through, try to figure out what it is that they actually want to do. Because also like playing a character in an improvisational way, which is what role play is, um, it sometimes you can make a decision in the moment and then be like, ah, that didn't fit the character. Like I just panicked, <laughs> whatever it was, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so I like the, the, the idea of giving them space, but what I want to ask you is, have you ever done that and found that the next time they come back that they're like, wait, wait, where were we again? You know, the, the whole thing about memory and like the, the space between sessions and people can kind of lose the details. Do you ever worry about that when using this type of cliffhanger? Yeah, so I would worry about it if there was going to be like a hiatus or something. Sure. Definitely. Um, I'm privileged in that my my party, my my gaming table right now is meeting roughly th- three times every four weeks. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're supposed to be playing weekly. Yeah. But, you know, a game gets canceled because of life. So because of the frequency, I haven't run into that problem. Yeah. Like players – remember they are excited to come back and like in this moment like in this example they they sat down at the table and there was no small talk before the game like they wanted to <laughs> they were like I'm they in. wanted like, let's do this <laughs> yeah let's make this happen so i i know that's maybe not a not a great answer but i think it's a consideration definitely like you you don't want to do this before like you take the summer off because you know that two of the people in your table, you know, travel or whatever. Yeah. Like if you're going to take a break, I, I would avoid this kind of thing. But at the same time, there's ways to do it, I think, without really having too much nuance. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? Like you could pose a moral dilemma that has less consequences than it might appear. Um, I'm trying to think of one on, off the top of my head. Uh, let's let's say a character meets a town guard. They're in they're in the city. They meet a town guard, and the town guard says, "Hey, I got to take a break. Here's my keys. You watch you watch the prisoners." Yeah. And you let them. You know, you you back off. Is that a moral dilemma? I'm not sure, but it's still this decision that the players need to like, Oh, am am I responsible for this? Like, do I really want to, or that's maybe a bad example. Let's say there's someone that they see sneak out of the guards, like barracks, like there's a burglar leaving with goods. Uh, Maybe they're picking a lock and then you end the episode with the, with the burglar being like, shh, don't say anything. And then you end the game. So it can be like these, these, types of situations that i think stick in your memory without too much context Mm -hmm. um 
I don't know. What do you think, Nick? Oh, it's tough because like I think that there are two ways to approach it. One being like if you have a stable group that's frequent, going to meet frequently enough and the group does not have any sort of like brain chemistry stuff that will hampers memory which my group like most of us including myself have adhd and just can't remember shit at any point of time <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes i'll be like i'll have set up something and then i'll hit them with it and then in the moment they're like oh my god and then the next time they come back they're like where were we what were we doing <laughs> and it's like no no but i also think that if you as a gm calibrate why you're doing it if you're trying to do it so that it's like next time on and they get really excited to do something offline, then I think that mix success, really judge your group, try to figure how invested they are in that sort of thing. And if if they are that kind of player, then go for it. That's going to be awesome. But if you're doing it, because it's like, this is a great way to end a session. Like, look at all of them being like, I'm so excited. And it's like, a like in the moment, this is just a good storytelling thing. Then do it all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I feel yeah, like yeah, it yeah, is yeah. sort of a thing where if you as a GM are not going to put a ton of stakes on whether they remember the details or whatever the next time, um, or if, if, they're, if you're trying to elicit a specific reaction that you're going to get the next time you start playing, and that is your kind of metric for success, I'd be like, just in general, don't do that because uh, you're going to be disappointed most of the time because I think that, you know, life is, life is busy. People think about different things. Like I remember when That's I started one of my longer campaigns, I made a wiki for it and I was like, constantly updating this wiki with the expectation that other people would be updating their characters wiki and like looking at all of the other things to say fresh or like oh what happened let me go like read the summary or let me go check into this character's sort of bio about the <laughs> stuff we know nobody ever fucking looked at that thing except for yeah. me like that was just, you were the just only me. one in there <laughs> <laughs> so i think that you just have to judge your motivations on some of this too like um i i just i hate I hate the the look in a GM's eye when they expect a certain reaction and then everyone just isn't sort of able to give it just because they don't remember or they're not interested or yeah, whatever yeah. it is. Um, so, and, and maybe that's... Yeah, I mean, yeah, people I listening know. know their table better than us. So yeah, yeah definitely yeah. take take it for what it's worth. Um, I'll, I'll say one other thing about this actually that... I think is super important and we should have maybe said it at the beginning Mm -hmm. is that while a cliffhanger can be super satisfying, you also don't want to steal from your table. The only satisfying plot reveal that might've happened in the game, right? Like Mm. if, if you're building up, you're building up, you're building up and then there's never a pressure release. Yeah. And the only way you do that is with these like cliffhangers. That might be a bad thing. Like people might not be, super excited about it they might even be able to like telegraph what's happening so you you don't want to elicit this kind of like expectation every single time yeah so make sure there's moments where you you still release the tension or create a cool a cool moment one such moment like this happened to me not too long ago when we were playing there was a there was a combat scenario where the players encountered a hag in the in the combat scenario and it was the first time they had run into into a hag and just the the way that the dice rolled that night the the players were getting decimated by the creatures like (laughs) the hag was destroying them and one of the only frontliners that the party had at the time got downed like she was unconscious on the ground and i'm like oh no like i i can smell a tpk coming yeah I'm going to give them an out. I know that hags make cool deals. Like that's what hags are, are known to do. I didn't have a deal already figured out, but I, I basically had the hag approach one of the other characters that was like alive and in the dungeon with them and tell them like, I'm going to give you, like, I'm going to offer you a bargain. Mm -hmm. I'm going to offer you a deal and I'm going to call off all my minions but I'm not going to tell you what it is. You have to agree to my terms before you know what they are before you yeah. know what the terms are. That's, that's what I'm setting up on the table for you. And, and there was a real part of me that's like, this is a great spot to end the night. Like let's end right here because it's so, it's such a cool decision, but 
the whole night had been this fight. So I felt like I was robbing my table. If I were to end the night here, I would be robbing my table of a cool kind of role play decision that I felt wrong. Yeah. So in that circumstance, I actually gave them the floor to think about what they wanted to do. I said, I'm going to go. I need, I need a beer. I need to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And then when I'm back, you're going to give me a decision and we're going to keep playing. Yeah. I went to the, get my beer and then I looked up cool hag deals on the phone and then, <laughs> and then, it, yeah, and then I came that. back. <laughs> yeah. One thing that I but, love about that too, uh, is just like the, so Franco Rio and I specifically disagree on this, I think, but I, okay. always, <laughs> I always am like, I want to include all of the different types of gameplay that people like to do within a session mm. so that there's not just combat so that there's not just role playing so that there's not just puzzles whatever it is um and i like the idea that like you are thinking of it more as in like robbing the the players of of making like a hitting a checkpoint almost if you're if you're thinking of it in like video game terms is like yeah, the checkpoint yeah, yeah. isn't right before you decide what the deal is it's right after <laughs> um, totally totally <laughs> and so i'm kind of interested that in this in this situation how long did you play after and how did that how did you bring that to a close that, that session did you just have them either accept or not accept the deal and then it was like all right guys great job. We'll see you next week. Or was it like, let's keep playing. Like, let's continue on in the story. Yeah, we, we did wrap up a bit. So, so they made the decision about whether or not they were going to accept the deal. And, and they did, they accepted the deal. Mm -hmm. And then we played on for another 30 minutes or so. So the hag said like, okay, let's shake on it. And she did like some weird ritual shook, shook hands. And in that time when I was taking my quote unquote break, I found a cool deal, which was to have the hag be able to see through the player's eyes at any moment that she wants to. Yeah. So I kind of described this scenario where the player started to feel sand in their eyes, but there wasn't any. And he like rubbed his eyes and couldn't take it out. And then the hag kind of said something cryptic. I forget exactly what I said, but she was like, when the sand goes away, you'll know that I saw what you see through your eyes. Something like yeah. something like this. Um, and then she disappeared in a puff of smoke. So I, I had her disappear, let the players kind of like figure out like they revived the person on the ground. They talked to one another. The, the character had this role play moment where he was talking about like, I just made a deal. Like what exactly is going on in my eyes if they feel weird? And they tried to like decode what the hag had said to them. And then I still, I I managed to still end it on a cliffhanger by having a building off in the distance kind of like fire start to erupt from the building and like it starts to break. So they're like, oh my God, what's going on there? And then we, we ended the night. Yeah. So... Yeah, so I'm not sure if that answers your question totally, Nick, but it, I, I didn't want to end it right away. I, I gave them some time to kind of decompress before lifting the stakes up again and then ending the night. Yeah, this is a really great thing about sort of like the, it, not even like pacing, but sort of like you said, the the tension meter. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, and I th- yeah, yeah. And I think I want to dive into that just after this break. Hey everyone, it's me, Nick, from the Tabletop Podcast. When I'm not hosting, I'm thinking about ways to create a better podcast for you guys, and I think I landed on something pretty fun. In fact, if you go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletop and join for as little as a dollar a month, you can get access to a new episode a month that we're going to start putting out. In fact, we're going to be calling this one Wild Magic, I think, in that we're going to talk about anything and everything that interests us us, not just TTRPGs, though there will be a lot of that. It is truly unhinged, and if you are a fan of the podcast and all of the hosts, you're definitely going to want to be on it. Uh, We're thinking of dropping these at the end of each month, so join our Patreon today. That is patreon.com slash tabletopped. Oh, and there's going to be so much more coming out in the new year there, so don't miss it. Sign up today. 
Welcome back, everyone, to Tabletop. We are speaking with Matt from Roleplay Chat, a wonderful kind of sister podcast to Tabletop. If you like ours, you'll definitely like his. Um, okay, Matt, so right before the break, we were kind of talking about tension and building and releasing it as a GM. And I kind of want to dive into this a little bit because you were talking about giving your characters a moment and then uh, kept playing post a thing where you could have ended it on a high tension cliffhanger. And then at the end you were sort of like, and then I had them see sort of this other thing that was happening to set up the next session. And that is also an anticipatory cliffhanger. So how did you make the decision between those two things? What like you said, you didn't want to rob them of this moment, but how did you sort of like make that decision? And what was the thing that made you make, you know, go one way rather than the other? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, it's really good that we're talking about pacing Nick because I don't think we can talk about cliffhangers without, without it. Um, And I tend to follow a rule of thumb where I like to try as best I can to make my, excuse me, to to make my games follow a reverse bell curve pace Mm -hmm. where we start the night high somewhere along the way, there should be some kind of, I don't want to call it downtime because Mm -hmm. that's, that's a loaded term that can be used for lots of stuff but you know the tension and drama should come down there should be a moment of reprieve before the 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 drama or tension starts to crank back up um now of course i'm not this not something that i'm going to force every time but basically what had happened in this game was they started the game in a fight like they arrived in the cemetery there was skeletons and ghouls and they were chasing somebody through the cemetery mm-hmm. to me that felt like it was already pretty high yeah. as far as danger and tension goes and the fight kind of you know went on as fights do sometimes when there's a lot of moving pieces and 2 hours in i'm like mm, okay here comes the hag it's two and a half hours usually i like to keep my games short because we play very frequently in, yeah. in, in this particular campaign so like you said, I had this decision point where do I end it on a high without ever having really brought it down? Mm. And I decided not to. I yeah. figured, you know what, we need we need to give the players a moment to to relax, to to think of something outside of just this fight. And then the kind of the rest followed. Um so that that was kind of where I where I sat with it. I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, no, it sense. totally does. It's um, There's actually a really great thing. Stephen Sondheim once said about uh, when you're writing a musical or developing s- something in this sort of way, that one of the biggest things that you might need at the end when you have kind of packed all of your ideas into something is silence. You need to have the silence mm. because then it makes the sound feel better. Uh, they do this in movies all the time too. Like um, if you think of the second of the new the the um god what is his name the revenge of the jedi the new the new uh trilogy and the second like the middle movie that everybody hates i think it's great but whatever um <laughs> when you when you have that moment where the the like super star destroyer or whatever gets cut in half by the the people jumping like, like at light speed into it the they mm. they cut all of the sound because what they did there is just make a really visceral change you know what i mean and I think that I really like the idea that if you start a session in a certain mode, that you should at least try to go through two more modes <laughs> before you end your yeah. session, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whether that's down and then back up or whether that's higher and then down or whatever it is. Uh, I really like that sort of idea, like a way to frame it. And this is actually kind of leads into my next question about this. Um, you were talking about how you were trying to get into a more improvisational sort of way of like, like no prep or low prep sessions and, you know, telling stories that way with cliffhangers. A lot of times, a lot of people think that they need to be a hint of like some big thing in the overarching story. They need to be really well thought out. They need to do all this. How do you implement something that's like an anticipation builder when if you are kind of improv a session, you might not know when the session was going to end. You don't know where the, the party is going to get to or even go in some cases. How do you how do you give like what would you give as advice to folks who are trying to get into, you know, using these as a way to kind of spice up the endings of their sessions, but don't really have a way that they know to definitely get to a specific place. You know what I mean? To end. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really good. That's a really good question, Nick. Um, so I'll tell you, I'll, there's maybe two two answers to this. I'll tell everybody listening the way I've been doing it. 
but I'm, I realize that this might not be a very fulfilling answer. So I'll also say how I would have done it with a little bit more preparation involved. So in the current context, these cliffhangers that I'm coming up with, I am quite literally coming up with them on the spot. Mm. Like I don't even, I don't even know when I made that moment of like, oh, the building's on fire. I didn't know why. I didn't know who had done it. And it's kind of fun in in a way because it creates this easy to-do list. Before I play my next game, I need to figure out why the building is on fire. Yeah. Who put the building on fire? And I've got enough factions at play that I've already figured out and fleshed out that I can I can slot one in. Yeah. So it's almost like you're I, giving you know, yourself a writing prompt. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. It pretty much exactly that. You know, I just create a situation that if I were a player, I would want to engage in. And that's my cliffhanger, mm-hmm. Qu- quote unquote cliffhanger. Yeah. So maybe it's an NPC that the players love now finds themselves in mortal peril. And I have to figure out if they get out of it or not later. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, in the moments where there's like an interesting plot twist, that's the kind of stuff that I think would require a little bit more forethought. But it's surprisingly easy. And I think as long as you trust yourself, like believe in yourself as a game master, <laughs> that you're going to be able to come up with something interesting to justify the the moment of... of uh, tension and drama that you've generated and I, I believe in i believe in every one of you you can do it <laughs> yeah no this is really great because it, so within the, the the tabletop group there is some folks who are like zero story like you we do not we do not make story as gms the the players make stories and we also like collaborate with them to tell them and like but there is no one person who is building the story and instead what what and like I don't know if I 100% agree with that because in my case I have always sort of built like general arcs to like push people along. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I might not create like individual moments throughout every session or whatever, but uh, who can? That's that's crazy. <laughs> um, but we've kind of settled on the idea of like clocks of the idea that if the players don't intercede, that there is something that's going to happen or like people are working on something. And if the players don't stop them or stumble across them and, or interrupt them in some way, then this is just going to happen. And it doesn't matter if the players do or not, it's their choice to do whatever. But then you as a game master can say, I actually kind of know what is happening in the world around you. Like you were saying with the, your, your factions that you fleshed out, mm-hmm. you know who those groups are and what they want and what they're trying to do probably at any general given moment in a in a story and you're able to just sort of like like you said make a decision and then slot these things in um so i would also recommend like just having a general idea if you are somebody who's improving a general plot and you have to end a session and you're in a weird place where you <laughs> didn't think you were or you're just like i have no idea what next session will be like just take take a general idea from from what you were saying, Matt, of like, what is happening in the world? I'm just going to pick something and I'm going to do it and do it when you take a quick bio break before the end of the session or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. That's exactly it. And, and yeah, to to add to that, um, I think clocks are a great way to do it. There's a couple of games that are powered by the apocalypse that have these things called fronts. Okay. Which I don't know if we had the chance to talk about this uh, in the, our other conversation, Nick, but basically a front is a list of like, I think it's five steps. It's it's like the five step plan for your bad. Mm. Like what what they want to do and the five steps that they're going to do to get to that yeah. if they go completely uninterrupted by the party. Yep. So having something like that sort of figured out for the two or three villainous factions that are, you know, confronting the party if you have something like that figured out whether it be in a clock format or even just like a checklist of some sort you should kind of have that figured out if if you want to Mm -hmm. and each of those to-do list things could be a cliffhanger yeah like it, it, it could be like oh you see a cultist dressed in a robe, handing out pamphlets to their next like annual meeting or something. Even <laughs> if it's like the beginning of something, that's still 
a, a moment that the players can be like, oh my God, like I need to go interact with this. And then you end this, you end the game. Yeah. So you can be at the beginning of that, of that, or you can be at the very end where, you know, the, the town square is filled with blood and there's the, the pentagram on the ground and the demons coming, like the hand of the demons coming out. And that's where you end the game to start up next yeah. time. Like, that'd be cruel, but you could, <laughs> you could do that. <laughs> yeah. I, so I, I definitely like, using fronts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the clocks that I was talking about are basically like th- that must be a different powered by the apocalypse that just has slightly different terminology, but that's exactly what I, I usually use as well. Um, it, I, I just think that like it doesn't even have to be faction oriented to like if you're somebody who's like, I don't ha- even have an idea of who is in this city, then just be like, like if you want a low prep thing you can do is just pick something and create one of these fronts or these clocks to to have on it like that's just happening in the city in the background so that if anything like if you just hit a moment where the players don't have something to do just fall back on the 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 front or the clock or whatever and say like oh yeah i decided earlier that there's like an earthquake that's going to hit this town if in case like the magic ley lines under the the city are disrupted and so like unless the players go and stabilize them this is the the checklist of what's going to happen the final one being the ground opening up and the town falling into the earth you know Um, that's perfect yeah Yeah. exactly so you can even Um, make it just like abstract it out from from people or things or like your overall story if you have some something like that too you can make it a little bit more environmental yeah yeah and i mean you talking about your one of your co-hosts who doesn't believe that the game master ever tells any of the stories a very interesting <laughs> opinion i disagree with yeah, it you got it because of the role that we have yeah at the table Matt, but i'm telling you I, you and franco gotta sit down <laughs> you gotta yeah, sit down yeah one and of talk. these days uh it's just one like yeah basically it's just like like i guess in his mind it's like who am I to like force this story down a group's throat when it's sort of like a collaborative experience and we're finding out what's happening together. I build the sandbox and then they tell the story and I facilitate that and I help them. Like I add my, my flair on it. Yeah. Yeah. But, there, that, that's totally okay. Yeah. Like if that's the way he wants to run. Yeah, no, it's just so different. Like even for it. me, like it's very different. Yeah, even yeah. for me, I'm like, but, I have something that I'm going to try to say. <laughs> <laughs> But what what I would say in that context, if you're somebody who's listening who's like that, I think one way that you could still implement interesting cliffhangers is to look to your players. You look to the things that your players value, the things that your players and their characters like. What is their what is the character's moral compass like, or what is something that you know that a character has this specific weakness and if you baited them with it, they might, they might trigger them to do something fascinating or interesting. You could create, if you wanted to prepare uh, moments that could create cliffhangers, you could think of each of the players in your table and their characters Mm -hmm. and come up with one or two situations that would entice them to interact with it. And then from there, you kind of have a little a little backup list of potential cliffhangers. You know, I'm I'm trying to think back to uh, a player that I played with a long time ago. Who he, he had this character who was a dwarven slayer, and in the Warhammer universe, slayers are these uh, like military focused, very reckless, live for glory, die for glory you know be be part of the history books kind of uh kind of mentality they're even it's even more than that because i just recently learned about slayers it's like oh cool you have been (laughs) you have been dishonored in the only way you can regain your honor which is like you said like a core part of their like ideology is by dying fighting a monster in combat so they're just keep going for the bigger and bigger monsters until something can kill them (laughs) yeah so you know a character like this is just ripe for situations where you put them in a situation where yeah there's a big bad monster or the night's about to end and then all the little monsters that were running around get gobbled up by an even bigger monster and then you end the night and then you can see the fire in the slayer's (laughs) eyes like i gotta go kill that monster that's my my destiny so i i mean are we writing the story or the players or are we manipulating the story yeah. to be what the players want to see it's I, you know that could be a debate that we could sit here all night talking about but that's another way to make a cliffhanger less about the plot 
of the factions going on and more about the characters, I think there's a way to do it. Uh, definitely. Absolutely. I think that that is a really great way to it of like taking a known habit by a player or a known character trait of a character and then just sort of like press like pressing a button that activates <laughs> one of those things um you can usually rely on people to to kind of act in a certain way unless they're like completely disengaged um so i think that that's a that's a really good piece of advice as we kind of wind down here i want to ask you what is your favorite cliffhanger that you've either ever done or as a player ever experienced like what in your mind is like the everest of cliffhangers that you've come to <laughs> yeah yeah well this is a hard question to answer but there's one that comes to mind right away that i really really appreciated um this was a long time ago maybe two or three years ago and i was a player in this scenario where I was, it's again in this Warhammer uh, fantasy roleplay game that's been going on for a really long time now, mm -hmm. where I, I'm playing a wizard, uh, uh, an Azure wizard. So we're like astromancers, can see the future. Mm -hmm. And I had a mission, I you know, self-imposed, where I wanted to climb up to the top of a mountain to go inside of a lightning storm to make a staff for myself. Mm -hmm. Because that is like where my kind of magic like resides. Yeah. And anyway, we, you know, we spent a couple of games, me and the party finding our way up to the top of this mountain. And when we get to the top of the mountain, there's this gigantic dragon that's sitting up there and it's spewing lightning out of its mouth. And I'm like, Oh my God, we got to take this thing down. Like this is going to be <laughs> so cool. We start fighting the dragon. And then when we get, our first attack, like our first attack connects to the dragon, we realize that it's actually an illusion, mm. that there is a group of gnomes at the top of this mountain using like illusion magic to trick us into thinking that there is this dragon there. So we have this moment where we're like, we expected one thing and then we got another. Yeah. <laughs> and then before the end of the night, the gnomes kind of like dissipate and there's like this moment of pause. And then a boulder like cracks open and there's a shaggeth, which is like this giant beast of a, <laughs> like almost like a centaur yeah. made of rock just sh shows up and we're like, okay, back to a hundred, a <laughs> hundred miles an hour. Like we're fighting a giant monster. And then, and then the, the night ended. Yeah. So there was this roller coaster of emotion that I think is going to live with me for a really long time. And I think the magic of that roller coaster was really playing with our expectation. Yeah. You know, we went to the top of the mountain expecting a big monster. We got the big monster, but it just wasn't how we thought we were going to get it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that so, idea of just yeah. like, it's sort of like the, the head fake of like, oh, gotcha. Nope, just kidding. Yeah, you were yeah. right all along. <laughs> <laughs> so great yeah totally uh yeah. Matt, how about yourself nick Is there for one me that let's see um there it actually probably happened really recently uh and also going back to the uh, no brain good bad memory but um recently we did, did the, we're in this water deep campaign uh and we were we like we found this big tunnel under the ground and there's like some weird stuff that were going on around like these oozes and maybe some vampires like infiltrating the city. And so we were like going out to this vampires, like essentially like house party to be like, ah, that's where the bad <laughs> stuff's happening. But then we find like this NPC character like came, shows up and is like, oh, like it's so weird like to see you guys here. So like when we're chatting with her and then we leave and she's like, yeah, everyone's been so weird lately. Like I just have been like, not so, so hungry or whatever. I, I just feel kind of sick. I'm going to go home. So we go down into this thing, find this huge hole, like in the basement. That's like obviously a cavern that goes somewhere. And I'm like, so excited. I'm like, yes, let's go. Let's go. And then we're walking. And I was like, cause my character is a detective. And I was like, fuck, she is a vampire. Like I just, <laughs> like, I realized this in the moment and my character is just like, basically like looks down everyone's like sorry guys turns around like runs away uh, and we go back out because some of our friends stayed out there with her and had this huge thing where she was like no i'm not like what are you talking about like i'm in the sun right now this is like you, you guys are crazy like and 
she's sort of like a love interest of another character and the other character's like what what are you doing marks like you're being a, yeah, you're being yeah. a dickhead <laughs> and then she's like yeah this is just so frustrating i need something to cool my nerves and she takes out a bottle of wine and i was like obviously it's the wine <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> and then we like have this thing where we're like about to test her like we're about to find out and then it was like that's the end of the session we're gonna find out the next session nice. and i was like ah! because i was like screaming at everybody on, the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on our discord or whatever but it was it was a blast i really love that too of like that's cool like you said it's all about that that bell curve of tension of ending either ramping up like instead of ending on your way down and then you have to do all the effort of building back up the next session just do yourself a little favor and get a little bit of momentum going back up the the other mm-hmm. way and then you can end on that so much easier <laughs> definitely that sounds like a lot of fun uh matt before was we she a vampire she was a vampire oh, i was so okay, i was okay. fucking right. right she was a, a, yeah. a damn fear though <laughs> she, she was a damn fear and it was also this thing where it's like she didn't have all the weaknesses of vampires or like some of the traits because they're one of the vampires is like a scientist that I think is trying to essentially infect all of water deep to become these sort of mm. like damp fear uh, thralls, but they wouldn't even know it because it's basically making a, a willing population that just has one of those like sleeper agent switches where you could like yeah, basically wow. rule over them. It was very cool. It was a very cool idea. Neat. Very neat. Um, okay. So Matt role play chats coming back. When is it coming That's, back? Yeah. What should we expect from season five? Where p- can people find you? Yeah, thank, thanks, Nick. Yeah, so Roleplay Chat is coming back. Season five is starting up in March 2024. So people can go look for Roleplay Chat. That's R O L E space play space chat uh, on any wh- wherever you're listening to this I'm, I'm there i guarantee i'm there too so go go subscribe to the show if, if you're not already or go check out some of the back catalog if you're listening to this before season five starts um their chats exactly like this me and other creators i've had some really cool folks join me uh the season opener for for season five is with katie osaurus uh, who's a known member of the TTRPG space, who's a big advocate for people with neurodivergencies and ADHD. And we talk about exactly this, you know, running games for people who have ADHD, or if you have ADHD, if there are certain struggles that you struggle with, how could you maybe get over that hump? And, and or if you're trying to become a game master and you, you, you don't know if you have it in you, the answer is you do. And Katie gives some really cool advice and, and recommendations. So anyway, that's that's a really cool episode to look forward to. And uh, yeah. And on socials, roll underscore play underscore chat. I'm, I'm mostly on threads these days. I'm having a good time there, but still on X, still on Blue Sky, still on Mastodon, all that. All <laughs> still on all of these things that take our yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Matt, as always, it's been a huge pleasure. Uh, I'm so excited. You are actually the first interview of Tabletop's third year. So thank you so much for being a friend of the pod. And we'll see you again soon. My pleasure. Yeah, yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Nick. And everybody listening should look forward to Nick joining me uh, in that fifth season of Roleplay Chat. You can come listen to him talk over there, too. Absolutely. Everybody, if you like Tabletop and what you just heard, you can get more of it. Just subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. We release an episode every Monday, and we will see you next week. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.